Okay. <laughs> synapses. Neurons are connected at synapses. There are many different models of synapses, which might be surprising. Um, they capture many, many different properties with many different levels of detail, right? So, um, one, one other, yeah. So we were basically treating spikes as a thing that happens atomically at a time, right? One other model for a synapse is with conductance, where instead of happening atomically at a time, what you basically do is you have a current flowing across the synapse and you boot that current up very high and then it decays. So it kind of smears your spike out over a small little time window and it depends on the voltage difference between the pre and post synaptic neuron. Again, we have, we don't, okay, we have very good reason to think that for a lot of what we would be doing using spiking neural networks for machine learning that we don't care. We really don't care about the sort of conductance effects, right? We can get away with treating a spike as just this thing that propagates from neuron to neuron over synapse instantly, and that's probably good enough, all right? So yeah, again, many different models with different levels of detail. We, for doing machine learning, can probably get away with the simplest one. Synapses have an efficiency that determines, um, loosely speaking, how much of the spike gets across, basically, right? For any given spike, how much energy is deposited on the postsynaptic neuron? Um, what is the change in the voltage of the postsynaptic neuron? And adjusting those efficiencies is how spiking neural networks learn, right? So if artificial neurons have those big, if, if artificial neural networks have those big weight matrices, right, then spiking neural networks have the efficiency of these synapses. And adjusting those synaptic efficiencies is how they will learn. Oh, we should have had a video break. Oh, I'll, I'll cut it in in post. Um, all right, so yeah, there's a little bit of so with spikes, how is information represented? Um, information can be represented as the firing rate of a neuron, right? So we, rem we remember when I was uh, yeah. we remember when I was driving the Zakevich neuron with current that it sort of spikes very quickly and then slows down, right, and then stops when the current goes off, right? If that current represented some sensor that we were trying to process indicating that it found something, right? If it was a motion sensor or a temperature sensor, right? Then the amount of motion or the temperature change could be represented in how much current gets applied and that would in turn influence the rate of spiking, right? And that's a rate encoding, right? So if you had a temperature sensor that draws a little voltage for low temperature, which causes sort of low frequency spiking or a very high voltage for high temperature, which causes high frequency spiking, that, loosely speaking, is a rate encoding. All right? But we have good reason to think that the timing of spikes is also important, right? So that there might be important information not only in the raw sort of integral of the spike rate, but in the relative timing between one spike and another spike, right? So if you have a bunch of connected neurons, right, if you have a certain timing on those spikes, that might carry a lot of additional information above and beyond just the rate at which spikes arrive, and that is called a temp temporal encoding. I was gonna say timing encoding, I guess that works too, right? But temporal encoding. And this is, this is important because we're about to talk about how networks learn, and not all of the learning schemes are good at learning temporal encodings. Worth noting um, now, somewhat randomly, is that some, um, some spikes make neurons more likely to fire, right? So they are excitatory, and then some make neurons less likely to fire and thus are inhibitory, right? So some spikes have a positive value and some spikes have a negative value, basically. Some neurons don't make other neurons more likely to fire, they make them less likely to fire. And again, we have fairly good reason to think that the, the negative neurons are also important, right? Those can play a very large role in some kinds of rule. Um, I, I think, if I remember right, those play a very big role in, for example, allowing you to localize stimulus, right? 
So if I if you if someone touches your arm and your brain figures out which sort of patch of skin is under the touch, the inhibitory neurons play a very large role in shutting down adjacent cells, right? So that they make the brain able to figure out more precisely where the touch is happening. Anyway, we have reason to think that those inhibitory neurons are important. So how do we train SNNs? All right, now I'm going to do a video break.